Hi, I'm Louis Johnston, Jr. I love the church of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Since my mamma walked my little two-year-old legs to church with her every Sunday, where those loving ladies were so kind to me, serving Kool-Aid and cookies while telling me about this wonderful Jesus that loved me. I love the church, the bride of Christ, the worship, Bible training, from preschool to seniors, all of it. But the church has a problem we need to talk about and correct. There's a difference between tithes and offerings, and we should not mix those two. And here's why. First, I was raised since preschool age that my God required me to pay my tithe, defined as giving 10% of all the money I got to God Almighty himself by putting it in the offering plate at church. I was taught that the 10% was not my money, but it belonged to God. Not paying tithes is stealing. The truth, however, is that there is no such thing as a tithing plate or basket passed from pew to pew to collect tithes. There is only an offering plate passed from pew to pew to collect tithes and offerings. So they're never kept separated as God clearly commanded. This is sacrilege committed by the church. And thus it is my lamentation personally and for the church I love. Failure to keep tithes separated from offerings is a sacrilege to God because mixing them starts the process of stealing tithes from the only purpose they are to be spent to achieve. Quote, so there may be food in my house to feed those who can't provide for themselves in the local community. That's right, I said it, because the Bible says it clearly, which means the church is disobeying God because Christians won't simply read the Bible for themselves, including pastors and evangelists like me that were raised to obey whatever our religious leaders said. It is now my burden and task to expose this sacrilege for lamentation, repentance, and accountability. God forgive me and the church, for the church robs God by stealing tithes. We must repent. These three points are incontrovertible from God's word and history confirms it. Point one, tithes are only to be spent to feed those who can't provide for themselves. Two, offerings are to build, staff, and supply the church. Three, keeping tithes and offerings separated and spent only for their intended purpose is the spiritual and fiduciary duty of every Christian, including pastors, deacons, and elders. Before going public with my research and lamentation, I asked pastors from many denominations to review it and advise me of any error or omission they found and give me biblical proof if any existed. None of the pastors found any error or omission in any response I received. First, tithing was God's way thousands of years before Christ 
and the church came into existence. So preaching tithing is a requirement of God to fund the church is not found in the Holy Bible, period. Tithes have always been God's way to provide for those who could not provide for themselves. Tithes are very clearly commanded in the Holy Bible, as is the sole purpose of tithes collected. God's tithes system was first perverted by the Jewish rabbis who ended the third tithe entirely. The Catholic church leaders followed that lead, abused their authority as well, collecting tithes from the masses, but spending them on themselves and luxurious facilities all over the world. At least Catholics spend a small portion for God's purposes to feed the local poor and needy. Protestant churches originally tried to care for the poor and needy in their local community, but Protestant church leaders today blatantly collect and spend tithes to pay for their multi-million dollar facilities and staff salaries, while the local homeless, poor and needy get zero food or help. This sacrilege of God's system of tithes is incontrovertible if you can read and care. I can read and I care. Who, what, how is the third tithe really to be used? Not one dime is for buildings, staff, salaries, supplies, missionaries, or programs. Every third year, 100% of tithes must be spent on the local poor that cannot provide for themselves. Do you know of any churches obeying that command? If so, do they have a storehouse of free food to feed the local poor that cannot provide for themselves? A church accepting tithes without having such a storehouse is not obeying God's word. The third tithe is for those without inheritance or inheritance rights. Scripture details who it is for. In Deuteronomy 26, 12, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, then you shall give it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the orphan, and to the widow, that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied." End quote. This tithe is generally referred to as the poor tithe and is to be given to those in society who lacks widows, orphans, strangers, and the Levites were in ancient times those people without land and therefore could not provide for themselves. God has provided for these people through this tithe. This tithe was to be taken to the storehouse in your town and was used to help these people. It would have been enough to supply their needs for three years until the next three-year tithe was brought. The tithe brought in the sixth year would have been enough to last for four years. This is possible because God said he would provide enough in the sixth year to do it. Why tithe at all if they are not spent as God commands? The book of Malachi has a few things to say about tithing. This Torah passage might be the most perverted scripture. Quoting only the first half of the sentence of Malachi 3.10, then deliberately leading people to believe that the church is the storehouse. But the tithes are stolen from the local poor and needy. 
as the third year tithe clearly demands. This tithe is the most neglected tithe of all. This is not an easy commandment to keep. God wants us to give another 10% on top of the other two tithes. Is he asking too much? Are we not willing to give it? All we have, he has given us. Can we not give this to show our faithfulness? Abraham was willing to give his only son, but most of us are not willing to give an extra 10% of our income. Therefore, the poor and needy suffer in our backyards while, while funds God intends for them are spent on everything except them. Are you choosing another interpretation just so you can get out of this? Or have you just been misled by someone trained in error with their own personal agenda instead of God's agenda? Here is the passage in Malachi. Read this and consider what is said here. It is a strong rebuke, but repentance and obedience will result in great blessing. Malachi 3, verses 7 through 12, quote, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob Elohim? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says Yahweh of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says Yahweh of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says Yahweh of hosts. The Old Testament glorious, quote, glorify the Lord generously and do not stint the first fruits of your hands. With every gift, show a cheerful face and dedicate your tithe with gladness. That's from Sirach 35 verses eight through nine. That's in the Catholic Bible. In the New Testament, quote, in everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Now the, the early Christians, quote, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Acts Chapter, uh, chapter two, verses 44 and 45. Make certain you understand the difference in tithes and offerings. Only free will offerings taken up are to pay salaries, buy land, build facilities, send missionaries out. That's right, missionaries and foreign missions are to be funded 100% by free will offerings as the early church did for the apostles. Not one nickel of tithes was spent on these purposes. Only offerings were collected for these purposes. All good purposes to advance God's kingdom and the Great Commission, but not by stealing tithes 
God intends to feed and care for those in their towns who can't provide for themselves. Where is a single scripture that commands or authorizes in any way that tithes can be spent on facilities, programs, missions, or salaries? Quote, the laborer is worthy of his wages, end quote. It's true, but wages are paid by offerings, not tithes. As tithes are sacred to God, for his intended purposes to feed the hungry. Tithes are meant for the Levites, I hear that, or Jewish priests, is the other standard justification for collecting tithes and spending them on everything but the local poor and needy. But first, that argument just condemns conclusively that spending tithes for church buildings, facilities, and land, and programs, and advertising is absolute disobedience to God. Second, the reason God included the Levites was to provide for their food since they had no land to grow it themselves. The same as the, quote, stranger, homeless, widows, or orphans. Their ties to Levites were their payroll earned by their hard work of slaughtering the animals brought to the temple to sacrifice and worship to God, to clean up the bloody messes constantly made, haul those carcasses out and burn them, clean up, light the lamps, keep everything in the temple area in order. Now, do you know any pastors or staff today in the United States of America? that are banned from owning land to grow their own food or to work to provide for themselves and their families? Nope. Pastors today sell books, DVDs, have television programs, have their own nonprofit organizations they make money from, have houses and land. They could grow their own food if they chose to do so. So that dog just won't hunt to claim tithes God intended to provide food for the Jewish Levites priests is the same as paying salaries and benefits to church pastors or staff members. It is not the same, nor is it even close to being the same. No priest, pastor, preacher, or staff member labors in the temple slaughtering animals or cleaning up the bloody messes. So no, the tithe is not for them. This is the purpose of offerings, not tithes. What scriptures define the commanded use of God's tithes? Deuteronomy 14, uh, starting in verse 12. When you have finished setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the land in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. The local poor and needy were of equal importance with the Levites and priests, per God himself. Uh, picking up at verse 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all your that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away. Then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place your, the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God 
and rejoice and do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it into your towns. And so the Levites who have no allotment or inheritance of their own and the foreigners and the fatherless and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Did you catch that? All of the tithe for that third year you shall store in your towns. Deuteronomy 14, 28. At the end of the three years, you shall bring all, out all of the tithe of your yield for that year, and you shall store it in your towns. Now, for what purpose? Deuteronomy 26, 12. When you have finished paying all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, then you shall give it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the orphan, to the widow, that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. How long did the Jews obey God in giving one third of all tithes to feed the local people who could not provide for themselves? How about at least a thousand years? Deuteronomy scripture uh, that I just read to you. It was written around 1410 BC and second Chronicles was also written about 450 to 425 BC. So we know it was at least a thousand years. Second Chronicles chapter 31, verse five. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, olive oil, and honey, and all that the fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah, who lived in the towns of Judah, also brought a tithe of their herds and flocks and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God. And they piled them in heaps. They began doing this in the third month and finished in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed his people Israel. Hezekiah asked the priests and Levites about the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the family of Zadok, answered, quote, Since the people began to bring their contributions to the temple of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare, because the Lord has blessed his people, and this great amount is left over. Hezekiah gave orders to prepare storerooms in the temple of the Lord, and this was done. Then they faithfully brought in the contributions, the tithes, and the dedicated gifts. Quanania, a Levite, was the overseer in charge of these things, and his brother Shimea was in, next in rank. Note, there is a difference in these three things because each had a different purpose. Contributions, tithes, dedicated gifts. Each one God honors if we honor his intent and purposes for each of these and do not steal from one to claim it is the other and spend it for something God did not intend for it to be spent on. No excuse for not obeying God. So how does God feel about doing so? We see in the book of Malachi, written around 450 to 400 BC, after a thousand years of Jews spending one third of all tithes to feed the local needy. We see it in Malachi 3, verses eight through 10. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are they robbing you? In tithes and offerings. 
you are under a curse. Your whole nation, because you are robbing me, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. The book of Tobit, and that's in the Catholic Bible, by the way, chapter one. By the way, this book was in the original King James Version also, before it came to America. Starting at verse six, often I was quite alone in making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, fulfilling the law that binds all Israel perpetually. I would hurry to Jerusalem with the first yield of fruits and beasts, the tithe of cattle and the sheep's first shearings. I would give these to the priests, the sons of Aaron for the altar. To the Levites ministering at Jerusalem, I would give my tithe of wine and corn and olives and pomegranates and other fruits. Six years in succession, I took the second tithe in money and went and paid it annually at Jerusalem. I gave the third to orphans and widows and to the strangers who live among the Israelites. I brought it to them as a gift every three years. When we ate, we obeyed the ordinances of the law of Moses and the exhortations of Deborah, the mother of our ancestor, Ananiel. For my father had died and left me an orphan. Now, let's go to Tobit, book of Tobit, chapter four. Start with uh, verse seven. Set aside part of your goods for almsgiving. Never turn your face from the poor, and God will never turn his face from you. Measure your alms by what you have. If you have much, give more. If you have little, don't be afraid to give less in alms. By so doing, you will lay up for yourselves a great treasure for the day of necessity. For almsgiving delivers from death and saves people from passing down to darkness. Almsgiving is a most effective offering for all those who do it in the presence of the Most High. Verse 16, give your bread to those who are hungry and your clothes to those who lack clothing. Of whatever you own in plenty, devote a portion to almsgiving. And when you give alms, do it ungrudgingly. So the principles of tithing, A, give back to the Lord in gratitude a portion of everything God has given, whether through paychecks, dividends, unexpected windfalls, social security payments, allowances, or gifts. B, see the tithe as a sacrifice, a donation that seems almost more than affordable, an offering that makes holy, and that's the literal meaning of the word sacrifice, all the efforts and earnings of the past month. C, use whatever means the local community may use to identify your tithes as being a gift from God's hands through you, so God is honored when people see your commitment to regular support of the community. There are historical references to the third year tithe. A quote from the uh, Antiquities of the Jews, written by Josephus Flavius, a Jewish historian who lived about the time of Yeshua, documented the understanding of his time regarding the first and second tithe and how it was appropriated. He has great historic credibility because he was also from the priestly line. And I quote from him, his book. Let there be taken out of your fruits a tenth, 
besides that which you have allotted to give to the priests and the Levites. This you may indeed sell in the country, but it is to be used in those feasts and sacrifices that are to be celebrated in the holy city. For it is fit that you should enjoy those fruits of the earth, which God gives you to possess. It is spoken of two different tithes here given in the same year, namely the tithe for the Levite and the tithe for the feasts. He later writes about another tithe paid every third year in addition to the other two tithes. Now Josephus clearly states about the third tithe that this tithe collected for the poor was different from the other two. And I quote him, besides those two tithes, which I have already said you are to pay every year, the one for the Levites, the other for the festivals, you are to bring every third year a third tithe to be distributed to those that want or have lack, to women also that are widows and to children that are orphans. That's Antiquities chapter 4 uh, and 8, 22. Clearly, Jesus and his contemporary historians knew and obeyed God's intent and purpose for one third of all tithes, which is reflected throughout the Holy Bible. In the words of Jesus and many others, the purpose of tithes is to provide for those who cannot provide for themselves in their local communities. Quote, Besides those two tithes, which I have already said you are to pay every year, the one for the Levites, the other for the festivals, you are to bring every third year a third tithe to be distributed to those that want, to women also that are widows and to children that are orphans. The Waldenses existed in the 1500s. Uh, they were a group. They observed a his earlier historical writing of Pasadini regarding the givings of tithes and the purpose for tithes. Now I use this incontrovertible historic reference because most people will say that the temple and Levites are a prerequisite for all tithing. Well, this shows that it was probable that this tithe was still given even after the destruction of the temple. It makes perfect sense to me as the widows and orphans and strangers will always be among us as Yeshua also said in Matthew 26, verse 11. The Waldenses recognized that they were the true successors of the apostolic church. They kept the Sabbath and also the yearly Passover. In about 1200 AD under the name of Pasagini, we have a very clear picture that these people observed the whole Old Testament law, including the Sabbath and festivals, even though the Catholic inquisitors zealously burned the records about anyone living God's way of life at that time. That's one thing to be said for the Roman Catholic Church. It is very diligent at certain things, including feeding the hungry but often led in the wrong direction because of evil and misguided leaders and mankind and the universal church suffers by it. The membership paid a three-part division of tithes to God through the ministry of the Waldensian church. Even in the 1500s, the same division of tithing still continued among the Waldensians. In his book, History of the Waldenses, the author, uh, Leonard, quoted George Morrill, a Waldensian elder, as saying, quote, the money given us by the people is carried to the aforesaid general council and is delivered in the presence of all, and there it is received by the most ancients, that is, the elders and part thereof is given to those that are wayfaring men according to their necessities, and part unto the poor. So George Morrill actually mentions a second tithe, apparently for those traveling to and from the festivals and following it. 
he mentions the third tithes, which goes to the poor. Feast goers who had more second tithe than they needed shared their excess with those in need at that time as well. So we see there that they had not just a little bit of God's truth, but quite a bit. Probably most of God's truth as we have it today. The oldest church in history tells about the truth about tithes. Now if you go to catholic.com, quick questions, what is the church's position on tithing? You'll read this, quote, Although the church teaches that offering some form of material support to the church is obligatory for all Catholic adults who are able to do so, it doesn't specify what percent of one's income should be given. Remember, tithing was an Old Testament obligation that was incumbent on the Jews under the laws of Moses. Christians are dispensed from the obligation of tithing 10% of their incomes, but not from the obligation to help the church. Every Christian should support the church financially. I am honored to do so. The key to understanding how God wants us to uh, give uh, to the church is found in 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Quote, on the first day of the week, each of you should set aside whatever he can afford. And in 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 5 through 8, it says, So I thought it necessary to encourage the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for your promised gift, donation, so that in this way it might be ready as a bountiful gift and not as an exaction. Consider this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each must do as already determined, without sadness or compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Moreover, God is able to make every grace abundant for you, so that in all things, always having all you need, you may have an abundance for every good work. Now to paraphrase, God doesn't demand a fixed amount of money from us. He wants us to give from the heart. If people are forced by their church to give a certain percent of their income, that's extortion. If they give freely and cheerfully the amount they are able, that's a gift. So, in conclusion, clearly the church preaching tithing Collecting tithes, but not obeying God to provide for the local needy who cannot provide for themselves. That's the responsibility of every Christian to respectfully demand correction, repentance, and restitution made in full. Stealing tithes from the local poor is sacrilege. We must stop immediately and repent with restitution, not lip service. Additional passages on the biblical basis of tithing, I'm putting up in this graphic below so you'll have the time to write these down. Some of these books are in the Bible, you know, some are in the Catholic Bible, which also were in the original King James Version of the Protestant Bible. Johnston Jr. from the War Zone. Louis is the founder of Layman Lessons, which facilitated over one million meals to feed the homeless last year, all with an unpaid staff. He is NBA educated, an author of over 10 books, published articles, and has crafted dozens of pieces of legislation. He founded AmericanConstitutionCenter.org, an online public library for Judeo-Christian heritage. 
PatriotPastors.net was launched for training Christian pastors and patriots. BlueWingUSA.com provides a bridge between business needs, solutions, marketing, and media strategies. Louis Johnston Jr. from the War Zone. LouisJohnston.com.